Welcome everyone to today's presentation. Uh, one of the things that we are very grateful as part of the research park is that um, all of our companies actually have access to a lot of university resources. And one of them is faculty staff assistance services. And uh, we have a lot of wonderful people who are part of the university uh, and in these roles and serve maybe uh, in, in, in a constituency maybe that you're, you're not familiar with. So we won't get too much into the actual services that are provided, but uh, we are we will drop that link into the chat later. Um, but as part of that, of course, we have access to the wonderful people who work in faculty, staff, assistant services. So um, I'm very delighted that Morris Mosley has joined us today. I've had the, uh, the uh, good fortune to actually have heard him present a couple of times during COVID and uh, probably um, pre-COVID, you know, wasn't as familiar with his work. He's a, a, a person who's very engaged in the community, is, has served in many different roles in various community institutions and joined the university about 10 years ago. Um, and we felt that uh, his messages and the various different uh, ways that, that I actually was able to see him present was very important uh, to some of the some of the things that are happening here in the research park, of course, as and and frankly everywhere else. But as we understand what has been happening in our workplaces over the last eighteen months and what is continuing to happen, as we know that it's uh, a never-ending process. So uh, thank you all for joining us today, and I am going to turn it over to our speaker. So thank you very much, Morris, for joining us. Thank you very much, Laura. Good to see you again. Um. I should tell you a little bit about what I do here at the university. I am one of um, four EAP counselors, but my specialty is working with groups. So here at the university, that means I work with groups of people who work together. Now I'll leave it to your imagination as to what that actually means. But generally, if we work together for any length of time, patterns start to emerge. And these patterns come more from families than from what we actually design in the workplace. And so, because we're all from different families, we have different belief systems and it impacts how we communicate. So I travel on site to work with groups of people who work together to help sort out problems, um, sometimes address issues related to change and things like that. So it makes it interesting uh, is the current time that we're in. Nothing like this has happened before. And so what we have is a situation where we've been asked for the last year or so, to stay away from each other. And now we are being asked to come back together and work together after a year of, oh, some unprecedented events. Generally, COVID created a situation where we had to shape a belief system around staying away from each other um, isolating ourselves socially, and then the impacts of that. Returning to the workplace is interesting because the workplace is a group setting. Everyone here was hired with the idea of working with a group of people. Our work is, is interchangeable in a lot of ways. Our work overlaps. Sometimes um, all of our work impacts the work of someone else. So we have to be able to sort out differences, problem solve. This presentation really is about shaping the culture or reshaping the culture uh, post COVID. It's a perfect opportunity to make some changes because the culture has already shifted. The difference is we can, by design, choose to make the culture what we believe is currently appropriate, or we can by default see what happens. Problem with that is that we have to react as opposed to be proactive. So I wanted to share some thoughts on what that process might involve. The first thing that it tends to impact is how we problem solve. This is probably one of the most highly requested uh, skill sets in the workplace. There are some existing trends in the workplace that we have to take into consideration of how are these trends affected by culture? And culture simply means um, in, the, in the workplace currently, 
we have been moving over a period of maybe the last 10, 20 years to make the workplace either more about me or more about us. And based on the direction that we lean, it creates culture. So we have to look at problem solving trends in terms of how they impact cultural trends. For example, common ground is a problem solving trend that says, let's start with what we agree with. Now, the current culture in the workplace says, it's about where I wanna start. So the conflict starts at the beginning when we should be looking for common ground. We have a tendency to resort to a level of comfort, let's call it, about the way we do things. Compromise is another form of problem solving that says we both are really willing to make concessions. But if my focus is on me and not us, then a compromise is actually a loss. It's, a con it's, it's not problem solving. Collaboration, the idea of working with someone. Collaboration allows us to create as we go, to figure out what kind of methods, operations work best. The dilemma here is it, it, it tends to conflict with current culture that says silos in the workplace are kind of popular, priority. Silos actually conflict with organizational structure. A silo is an informal system that's vertical. Organizational structure tends to be horizontal and vertical. Win or lose is a strategy that says this is about getting my way. Um, it's prevalent in culture because a lot of the gaming approaches are really win-lose approaches. There's no middle ground. And the innovation in a place like the University of Illinois has a high priority. What can we create that's never been done before? And sometimes this means this innovation is what solves the problem. So when you look at all of these possibilities and how culture affects how we interpret them all, we end up with one that's more popular than the others. So if you had to guess, which of these is currently more, most popular in the workplace? What would you guess? I'll let you think about that. Enter your, um, your guesses in the chat box and questions along with that. And don't hesitate to interrupt me if you have a question, because I kind of run these presentations like I do groups. We talk to each other whenever possible. I'm still getting used to talking to pictures and names, but we'll get there. If we take a look at a problem solving model, this is the concept of what happens when we are faced with a, a problem or a conflict. Typically the event itself, whatever the focus of the conflict is, is more on the participants than the actual event what it is we need to be working out. When we engage a process, the first step in that which tends to be our favorite. What can we learn that would help us both understand the problem differently and might even help us behave differently? And so knowledge, expanding our knowledge base is the go-to response when there's a problem or conflict, which is a perfectly appropriate response but most problems are not related just to a lack of knowledge. And here the focus is on problem solving. So now we're starting to get away from who we're in conflict with and start to focus more on the problem itself. There's another step in this process called self-awareness. And this basically says, how do I contribute to the problem? Now, this one isn't as popular as knowledge, but actually the first step in problem solving is to understand how I contribute to it. So ownership as opposed to blame. But we tend to look again for how we disagree or how we differ as opposed to how we're similar. And ownership says, what's your tolerance for critical feedback? What's your tolerance for your own imperfection? Are you willing to say, without knowing, I think I contributed in this way. And if both parties are willing to do that, then we immediately see how we contribute to the problem. And sometimes the conflict is related more to personal triggers than it is to the problem itself. And then there's another phase of decision-making. And this says the focus is on feedback. Sorry, my hands are cold down here. Um, 
feedback says, is there an exchange that helps us look at this thing from a different perspective? Are we willing to find that out by engaging in a conversation? What can I learn from the conversation? So a lot of times what we call difficult conversations are really a focus on how do we make decisions based on you know, our, our disagreements? Ultimately, because this is the workplace, we have to look at outcomes. And another way of learning, another way of problem solving really has to do with what kind of learning takes place as a consequence of the choices that we make. So there's a clear difference between making a choice and not making a choice. But if I choose to go in that direction, I have to own the decisions that I make. So at some point in this process, ultimately we will make a decision. That's not the end of the process. It simply means that I'm gonna learn something from the process and it may make a difference on what I choose as a next step. It's a valuable source of learning. A lot of times we call it learning from experience. As we get older, it's our preference because we have more experience to learn from. But early on, we're looking for ways to kind of understand. So if we were to look at the way things really happen in the workplace, we still have all three of these that are available to us. But let's complicate this with conflict avoidance because problem solving begins with a willingness to solve the problem. Yet we're in a very conflict avoidant environment. And so that tends to kick in place first. Which means that any event of a problem, the first thing that we have a tendency to do is drop the processes, focus directly on outcomes, what happened, who's at fault. And so all we're really reconciling here is blame. Now this creates an environment where people actually don't want to problem solve because it's a consequence. I may be viewed as a problem. I may be viewed negatively. I might be viewed as incompetent. And so the opportunity to learn from experience is gone unless we are willing to exercise that little piece in the middle that says, is there a way I contribute? There's only two of us involved in the conflict. It didn't exist before the two of us had it. So we must contribute in some way. Let's take a look at how we might contribute but that involves a willingness to own some things. It is a consequence of conflict avoidance in the workplace. When we look at these different approaches, we come up with different ways to solve different types of problems. So problems that are related to policy and procedures are pretty straightforward. Identify what the best practice is based on policy and everybody do that. It says that some of these are not up for discussion and are not a preference. There is a way we've chosen to Proceed. Opposing views start with establishing common ground, but focus more on what we have in common. In this way, we are able to engage collaboration or compromise. Ulterior motives. This means I want my way. I believe that getting my way is the solution. And so, how many times in the course of trying to sort out something do we acknowledge, hey, we've kind of gotten into this win lose thing? And we're never going to come to some terms. We probably need to acknowledge that the win loses in place and start to focus on something that doesn't deteriorate relationships, that doesn't kind of devastate our um, environment that we work in by making everything win lose. Then we're able to establish some common ground and start the process over. And then there are these emotional triggers. These are the things that really require us to be aware of ourselves. Emotional triggers essentially don't always operate at the level that we are aware of. They can be operate on a whole different level of consciousness that make us pretty much oblivious to the fact that they're in play. So we might be triggered by um, our interpretation of what losing a conflict is, or for that matter, making a conflict win and lose. So if we're thinking in that direction, it's going to trigger us. Sometimes we can be triggered simply by things not going the way we think they should because of what that means to each of us personally. So if I have a belief that it should go this way and it doesn't, I have another belief attached to that that says, this means X. 
I'm not as competent. I'm not as acceptable. I'm not as, I don't approve or people don't approve of me. Gets into a whole nother discussion. The idea here though is how do we improve our coping behaviors? See, problem solving isn't just what's the problem, how do we fix it? It's what's the culture related to how we approach the problem? Since COVID, this is probably one of the biggest areas that needs to change because COVID says we get nowhere unless we work together. Most of our efforts are counterproductive unless we are looking out for each other. We can't do this by ourselves. If you bring that back to the workplace, it says our culture then really has to have a group focus again because we've been leaning this way for a while. It's about me as opposed to this other way. It's about us. COVID says the priority of us has returned. So how do we prioritize group process? One way is to consider the advantages of collective intelligence. What happens when we put our heads together to problem solve? This book, I love this book, actually has to do with understanding emotional intelligence in, in a collective atmosphere, in a group. See, I have a personal belief that emotional intelligence doesn't even exist unless it's interacting between two or more people. Cognitive intelligence is on all the time, but emotional intelligence really has a lot to do with how we understand each other, how we empathize with each other, how we anticipate each other. If you can get a group of people to start thinking about including everyone and acknowledging that there are individual needs that need to be responded to, but there's a collective way of doing that so that we are in front of the ball as opposed to behind it. A good example would be the transition from childhood to adolescence says the priority is not just me anymore. It's about us. I need the acceptance of the peer group. So somehow I have to figure out a way that we all can still get our way because from childhood, it was about me and what I wanted. In adolescence, it's about us. I need this peer group's validation and I trust this peer group sometimes more than family. It's a phase of development where the priorities shift. So the question here with emotional intelligence is, does the group have an ability to generate a shared set of norms that manage processes of emotion? Do we care about how others feel? And the work environment is kind of interesting because if you work together with a group for long enough, you know when somebody's off, had a bad morning, something's on their mind. In fact, typically everybody in the room can tell. But how often do we ask? How often do we see the workplace as a place where we can get support from our colleagues? Because we spend so much time in the workplace, a third of our lives. Uh, the other third, we're sleeping. And the last third is for everything else that's going on in our lives. So work takes up a great deal of space and it becomes the environment that we're most likely to develop problem solving skills interaction skills, engagement skills, all kinds of things, because we have that audience. The most, collective intelligence really focuses on two types of skill sets. Personal competence, which focuses on self-awareness and self-regulation. Am I aware of how I feel? Am I aware of what triggers my feelings? And in regulation, can I own them? Or will I, will I decide that somebody else is responsible for how I feel. Ask yourself a question. If you find yourself triggered emotionally, you have two options. One is find out who triggered you and try to find out why. The other is, why does this bother me? See, there's, they're very different outcomes. Instead of asking why someone triggered me, I should be asking, where did I get the trigger in the first place? That's a whole different process that involves raising awareness of my experiences that affect my judgment in the present. Now, if you've been around close friends, colleagues for a long enough period of time, what you have learned is a lot about each other's triggers. In fact, you may, more, you may know more about others than your own. But in a workspace, we collectively have some knowledge of what sets us off, what areas to kind of tread lightly? What areas that might 
trigger someone's emotions, and then those trigger the emotions of other people. Groups have to process this. They have to work through it. Otherwise, we stop talking to each other in the workplace. And the environment of the work actually becomes more important than the work itself. In a lot of cases, we make adjustments. So we will restructure the workplace based on how we get along and how we don't. So now we have a dysfunctional environment that was structured around a dysfunctional norm. Now it's two steps to try to get better. Social competence acknowledges the idea of empathy. We should be concerned about each other. And problem solving, it's a collective process. We need each other to do it. The fact that it's a problem suggests at least that there's two versions. And we have to start looking at problems more in terms of resolving them than it being some kind of a conflict or an adversarial relationship. Before I go on, if there are questions, I'll assume you will ask or post them or something along those lines, or you can, you can interrupt me and ask a question at any time. Um, prioritizing group process essentially is about reprioritizing us as opposed to me. It isn't just a workplace that kind of is really focused on group process. Right now it's life. We've had a period of time where we focus more on our individual needs, gains, things like that. The current time says this thing has to swing now back to the other direction. Human beings are social animals, always have been. It isn't likely that that DNA is going to change in the short haul. So we do have to start asking questions about how do we work better together? How do we engage better? How much does that impact the work that we do? We've known for a while that groups, especially groups that are diverse, function better than pretty much any group on the planet because you've got perspectives coming from different sources, different experience groups, all kinds of advantages. But the focus is on a group process to problem solve. If we were going to take a look at our belief system and manage emotions, feelings, here's a thought. If you manage your negative and unproductive thoughts, you will feel a sense of engagement. If you practice healthy behaviors, you will feel a sense of wellness. If you engage in uplifting reciprocal relationships, you will feel a sense of acceptance. If you make positive differences in the lives of others, you will feel a part of something bigger than you. If you pursue a worthwhile goal, you will feel a sense of achievement, purpose, contribution. If you regulate your negative or difficult emotions, you will feel positive emotions. Emotions really kind of emanate from past experiences. So if I have some sort of emotional pain, I create the emotion of fear as I anticipate the pain returning. It's unique to my experience. My understanding of fear is different from yours. If I anticipate fear, I create my own version of anxiety. If I anticipate anxiety, I create my own version of panic. If I anticipate panic, I will create my own obsessive or compulsive behaviors to manage my panic. The same holds true with joy. In anticipation of joy, we create hope. In anticipation of hope, excitement. In anticipation of excitement, exhilaration. You ever watch a 10-year-old Christmas Eve? They're anticipating excitement. And then when that clock moves into Christmas Day, you probably hear some of the strangest noises you've ever heard as they wake up and head downstairs or to the tree. We create the feelings. That means that we have the power to regulate them. Feelings are voluntary in nature, but they are unique to our own experiences. We are familiar with them. Everyone should have a goal of learning more and more about the things that affect you, that trigger you. Because I can guarantee you the people around you are doing that. They are learning your triggers. In a supportive environment, it means they can be empathetic. In an unsupportive environment, it means you can be manipulated. So, something to consider. 
if we were going to rebuild norms in the workplace, we would take a look at both individual needs and group needs. Individual needs are just like what we just talked about. Wellness, feeling comfortable in your own skin. Engagement, feeling content with the present moment. Positive emotions, feeling joy, hope, excitement, satisfaction. Then we cross-section those with group needs. Meaning, feeling purposeful or part of something bigger than self. Accomplishment, feeling the sense of achievement, creation, contribution. And acceptance, feeling the sense of belonging and support from others. These are all important things to human beings. Now, if we were to, excuse me, decide, let's start establishing some new norms in the workplace, in our work group. Let's have the discussion about what is the environment that we prefer to work in. How do we take into consideration the needs of both the individual and the group? We would then start to create norms by combining any two of these. Let's suppose you have a, an assignment for your work group that says, we're at a place where we really need to reevaluate the conditions of our environment, the culture of our environment. And maybe it's time for us to rethink what kind of environment we want. And so you give everybody the task. Take a look at this chart and find two things you think would develop a really good norm and then kind of describe what that norm is. And let's come back in a week and compare notes. See, we will all pick different things for different reasons. We will combine them with an intent of creating a norm that seems to be the result of both individual and collective process. And we start to reshape our environment. We've agreed now to treat each other consistent with the norm. So the accountability exists within the group. It's a good exercise to try, especially now, because currently trust has been affected within the group. And there is a norm in place that says, based on the fact that we don't trust each other, what kind of environment will we now work in? So you have a choice. You can get in front of this thing and be proactive, or you can get behind it and be reactive. But getting behind it means down the road, you're going to have to fix something. We have to open this discussion about bias. It has been something that we all know exists, but are real uncomfortable talking about. This is one of my favorite biases. It's called naive cynicism. And it says, it is our belief that we see the world as it really is. Although we don't often believe that our judgments are biased, we readily recognize that the judgments of others may be biased. So we can't see our own biases. Most cases, your biases will be present when you don't know it, which means that in the presence of others is when those biases may come front and center. So your acknowledgement of your bias almost always comes with an audience, which is what makes it difficult to accept. But the reality is, as we get to know each other, we learn more about each other and not just what we share. How much can you learn from what someone doesn't tell you? How much can you learn from what they choose to tell you? How much do you rely just on what they tell you? So a lot of information is being shared anyway. And since 80% of communication is nonverbal, our biases are on display. If you're from this planet, you have biases. It is normal human response. It really has to do with our brains processing the way we do. We can process an enormous amount of information, or at least take it in. But being able to retain and get meaning from it is very different. It's the difference between being able to absorb millions of bits of information, but only to be able to acknowledge about 40. So what happens when we're being affected by all this information, but we can only acknowledge a little of it. Well, we tend to then fill in the blanks. And the blanks that we fill in create bias. We don't have enough time to make a decision. So expediency creates bias. We need more information. So lack of information creates bias. We got too much information. So our ability to sift through it all creates bias. There's a lot of things, generally four groups of things, that make us create bias because 
There's a part of us that's been affected, but another part of us is not aware. If you're from this planet, you have bias. We need to start having the discussions about it. There are currently, and probably changed since the last time I checked, about 260 known biases, and some of them are absolutely hysterical. I highly recommend that you look them up. Uh, a good example is Google bias. Google says, we're going to make it possible for people to look for information that they need. But our experience is that they're going to forget it once they find it. It's kind of like studying for a test. Cram, 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 and forget the day after the test. So what happens is Google bets that you'll be back to the website to look again. So they save that information so you can find it again. It's a bias of ours that says, I won't forget it. And the reality is we always forget it. They give it a name, Google bias. Uh, if we're focused on meeting needs as opposed to presenting problems, it will change our approach to problem solving. We have a high sensitivity to imperfection, to making mistakes, to the perception of incompetence. It's created all types of different issues in the workplace now. Bullying is on the rise, mostly because of our conflict avoidance. Um, the idea of Imposter syndrome is on the rise, mostly because of our intolerance for our own imperfection or our unwillingness to acknowledge that we might need help. That is created more by how we problem solve than anything else. If all we're looking for is who to blame, nobody's going to speak up. Nobody's going to ask for help. Nobody's going to do anything that acknowledges that they might need it. If we look at engagement needs as needs as opposed to problems, then we start to approach the problem differently. Some skill needs, problem solving is a skill, conflict resolution is another skill different from problem solving, and leadership is one of the most highly demanded skills in the work market today. These are needs. If we respond to this, we solve the problem. But if we focus just on the problem, we tend to create a defense system. A good example would be in a conflict avoidant environment, we don't actually problem solve, but we find other ways to reconcile a problem. One of the ways to reconcile a problem is to blame. Now, blame then creates a whole nother skill set. How do I avoid being blamed? It's like going to work knowing that I need to cover my back all the time and being at a heightened level of awareness because I anticipate being blamed. And that stays with you throughout the course of the day and some of it you take home at the end of the day. And you start to feel it again on your drive to work the next day. Over time, I realized the only way to really avoid being blamed is to avoid being accountable altogether. Whole new different skill set now. What do you think happens in a workplace where everybody's trying to avoid being accountable? Yet, if you're supervising anybody, you have an understanding that that is present in the workplace. It's like all the way back to adolescence. My son, at a point in his adolescence, could deny something while he was caught doing it. It was almost impulsive. It was like hand in the cookie jar. I don't know what I did. What did I do? I didn't do it. Yet, a developmental task of adolescence is assuming responsibility for my own behavior. If I don't do that in adolescence, it shifts to adulthood. If I don't do that in adulthood, it shifts to midlife. If I don't do it in midlife, it gets a little midlife kind of crazy because I'm not accepting the reality of who I am. So, identifying the need that has to be met. In a lot of cases, we find it's not a problem. It's a developmental task that I struggle with. And I make it into a problem because I don't know it's something I'm supposed to struggle with. Developmental needs about acceptance and approval. Ask yourself a question. If you had to choose between acceptance and approval, which one would you pick and why? One is fleeting. If you get it today, you'll have to get it again tomorrow. The other begins with self, an attitude towards self. It's kind of like saying, if I agree to accept someone as who they are, and they agree to accept me on the same terms, then I'm not fighting for approval every day. 
And that means also that I can validate myself internally. Otherwise, I'm left with seeking external validation constantly. At some point, shouldn't I know that I'm good at what I do? Shouldn't I believe that I'm good at what I do? Shouldn't I act like it? Well, the dilemma here is if I need that high level of external validation, it means that there's a low level of internal validation. One is icing, the other is the cake. Internal validation is a necessity of development. External validation is nice, but we were born seeking external validation as children. As adults with more experience, you either believe you are competent or you don't. And so you do want to start saying, what do I think? What's my opinion? This is a shift in culture because the outcome changes the environment that you work in or the home that you live in. Knowledge and self-awareness are very different. Knowledge base says if I learn more, it could change the way I do things. So I'll learn more. Self-awareness says, if I own more, it might change my outlook. It might improve my coping skills. I have a better understanding of who I am. And since other people are forming opinions about who I am, I think I should probably do the same. And then choice. Ultimately, we make choices. We have reasons for the choices we make. As human beings, we are not obligated to make good choices. We can make choices that make no sense at all to anybody but us. We can make a choice that's dead wrong, but we just want to. Choice says, even if I make the decision to do something that goes against the grain, I will own the outcome. Sometimes, though, we struggle with the concept of having made a choice, which makes it difficult for us to assume responsibility for the choice we just made. And then you cut off an area of experience. For example, as we get older, we have two ways to gain information on our own. One is to consider the possibility that I may contribute to this problem in ways that I haven't realized yet. So let me take a look at becoming more aware. The other is I can get some feedback from people that I trust. They've known me for a while or they've watched my behavior or they've watched my performance. Maybe I can learn more from how I'm viewed and how I affect others. So there's this process that says, I can learn from increasing my self-awareness. And I can also learn from my tolerance for feedback. Now, what if I'm not good at either or don't like either? What if the idea of looking at the part of me that I don't particularly like makes me not want to look at self? And I'm highly sensitive to critical feedback as well. Now, the only ways I can learn from my own experience are no longer available to me. Try to get out of a repetitive pattern without learning from your experience, either by self-awareness or by critical feedback. And in the workplace, it's essential. It's absolutely essential. Another shift in terms of the culture. Ownership is key. You start, let's say, owning something probably something that everybody already knows about. you. It encourages others to do the same. Ownership replaces blame. If you don't own, somebody will feel obligated to tell you and you will feel blamed. Ooh, just checking the time there. Um, I haven't checked the chat box. Any questions that have come up? It is so quiet. I feel like I'm talking to you. I, I see it's there, there is a question. question. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. So is, is someone going to ask it or am I going to read it? Let's check the chat box here. Cheryl, do you want to read your question? Bias is intrinsic to human beings and bias is not necessarily bad. Why is it that there is a theme in our society, if you will, that bias is only bad and that people, we have to train folks to not have bias? Isn't that a self-defeating goal? What that is, is a, a limited understanding of what bias is. Bias isn't good or bad, it exists. The outcome of bias tends to be good or bad based on how it presents itself, those circumstances, how it impacts the environment, 
how it affects relationships. But bias itself is as normal as any other aspect of being human. There are not two people on this planet that are the same. And that's a result of the differences in our experiences throughout the courses of our lives. How could we possibly, how could even two people possibly think the same with such unique experiences? So when did bias become bad? When we decided to not look for how it affects others, or we decided to not pay attention to the feedback that we get if it does affect someone. That ends up meaning that your bias has become something at a level of awareness that people around you know more about it than you do. And then it complicates things because they're going to respond to something that you are not aware of. You ever ask yourself, if I were going to approach something I see as a bias, how would I do it? How would I raise the issue? My wife has a, a knack of saying something like, you know, your bias is showing, like, you know, your slip is showing or something like that. And um, it opens a conversation that I'm, I'm aware of something, just checking to see if you're aware. But we are kind of focus on the idea that we have made a mistake and so defenses go up. And as opposed to saying, tell me more, we deny. And again, bias is something that always presents itself with an audience because you don't know it's present. And we don't like hearing things about ourselves that we don't particularly care for with an audience. Counseling is a good environment to, to um, explore biases. You have a therapist whose job is to listen to you raise your awareness, tell you things that maybe someone else won't, and you've agreed to do this exploration process. It's a good way to explore bias. Sometimes support groups are really good ways to explore bias. There's a series of groups that I offer that really are designed to raise awareness. Counseling is just raising awareness. It goes hand in hand with exploring bias. It's the same thing. I might have a bias that I'm less than other people. Everybody around me may not see that as a problem. I expand on something in a, way, a manner that reflects my low self-esteem and someone points out, here's how I see it. So I don't know where that's coming from. That's just a bias of mine. That isn't accurate or correct, but it's what I believe. So it has a tremendous amount of impact on how we perceive. It's a great question but it's not a self-defeating goal. Imagine yourself being comfortable with your shortcomings, comfortable with your imperfections. Who on this planet does everything well? And if there was such a person, our biases would kick in and we wouldn't like them. So you do want to accept the realities of being human and the realities that there's no two alike on the planet. That produces differences of opinion about the same thing. We could observe something at the same time in each other's presence and still be affected differently. The reason is not because the other person saw it wrong. It's because we both saw it differently. Bias is something that's an interesting discussion because you learn so much about the things you believe. And learning never stops. To the day we die, we are capable of learning. Great question, Cheryl. Did, did I answer that at all well, or is there more? I see comments on compromise and collaboration in terms of uh, problem solving. And um, on our campus, believe it or not, win-lose is the most prevalent thing I have seen. And when you consider all the things that influence that, it's not that surprising. Getting back to group needs, uh, group versus individual is the most common thing on the planet. As soon as we get past this point of the age of reason where we're no longer a child, our thinking expands. It's no longer just about me, it's now about us. But those two things stay in competition all the time because we don't lose one when we get the other. We have to learn how to make them coexist. And so the natural kind of opposites 
and they affect decision making in the workplace. It's the difference again between organizational structure and silos that we contrive. Group supervision. If you are a supervisor, ask yourself how much training have you had on supervising a group? Especially if you have a group that doesn't want to be a group. I think the concept of herding cats came from that, where you're trying to address the group and build cohesion and benefit from collective intelligence and all the good things that come out of a good, healthy group. But you have a group that doesn't acknowledge that it is one. I ask groups all the time, are you a group? Most of the responses are searches for why we're not. Well, we don't all answer to the same person. We don't work in the same building. Our work seems to be independent of each other. So we don't work together much. One question, does your work affect the work of other people? If so, you are part of that group. How many different groups could you be a part of? I've lost count. I've worked with over 400 groups in the past 10 years. And I've worked with people who are part of different groups based on the nature of the work. And so I've come to the decision that there is an endless number of groups on this campus because a, a project could become another group because of the overlap. When we look for problems areas, things that fall through the gaps, we look between existing systems. That's where the gaps are. So yeah, it's a trick to supervise in a group and groups develop just like individuals. There is a developmental process that groups go through. It's a whole interesting discussion. Establishing a collective identity should be a goal in the workplace. Meaning, who are we? I've watched groups, good groups, that problem solve in unique ways. They would have an open discussion that sounded like they were just in conflict. And then there'd be silence. And then the group would agree, okay, let's narrow down all these options to three. And then there'd be another discussion and be sound like a conflict. And then there would be silence. And then there'd be a final discussion. Okay, let's pick one approach that we were all willing to get behind for a period of time until we find out where it goes, how it works, what it needs for change. We have to take a first step. The second step, we'll have some information on. And so now the group goes into another discussion where they decide on one thing that they will support for the next 90 days. They'll get back together again and decide on whether or not they should continue to do that. That's a problem solving process that takes into consideration the opinions of several people and a willingness to cooperate with each other. As a result, we become someone. We have a collective identity. We're known as that group that solves problems that way. And if you're ever a part of a group that had a method of problem solving and a high performance response, you realize the minute you left that group, that was one of the best learning experiences of your life. And when you think about it too, everything about human behavior is about a social connection. It's about being a part of something. We punish people by isolating them from the rest of the group. That's what punishment is, which means we actually at our best when we're a part of something. We feel established. We have an identity as a group. Something to think about. As we rebuild our groups now and, sh and shift from cultures, what have we learned from what we've been through for the last year and a half? How do we compensate for what we want, where we want to go in the future? This is just an example of how we translate presenting problems and underlying needs. There's a skill agenda that says, the appeal of conflict avoidance over the skill of problem solving. Conflict avoidance has an appeal, but it can't replace problem solving. It surfaces in the workplace in terms of the impact of blame in the absence of ownership. This is a really difficult problem that happens in the workplace where we blame or we avoid accountability or ownership. Problem solving and win-lose dynamics in the workplace, we've kind of talked about. 
when lose dynamics destroys the working relationship because it's all or nothing. The priority of me over the value of us. Both have value, but sometimes culturally we shift into a place where it's more about me than anything else. It has to shift back the other way in a workplace. So things like self-centeredness, narcissism, and group dynamics, but his. This is a very involved discussion. Had it a lot with groups because the only way to address narcissism is in a group setting. The only way to address self-centeredness is in a group setting. That's how the person realizes how much impact they have on the rest of the people in the group. So we have to be willing to talk about it. And is self-centeredness trending? Well, I'll let you answer that. But essentially, the workplace has always been and probably will always be some form of a collective process. Otherwise, we have to ask ourselves a question. Am I willing to do the work of these other 10 people that I work with? Otherwise, we need each other. Silos and organizational structure, problematic because there are competing agendas. The externalization of approval over the internalization of competence. We talked about this. Approval seeking versus self-acceptance. And all of these things that show up as a result of a lack of self-confidence, competence, some sense of um, triggers, you know, what I'm triggered by and what it means. These are things that are, again, on the rise in the workplace, something we have to consider. So I think that these are more things to consider, personal growth and, and professional development, and power differentials and group supervision should be essential training tools. Rebuilding the work group, so that developmental agenda and acknowledging the balance between the individual needs and collective needs. And then learning styles, accepting feedback. Um, we get triggered by critique. How will that affect what we are hearing? And then self-awareness. We have to maintain the capacity to learn from our own experience. Think about it when you're 85 years old, who are you gonna to listen to? Nobody. You're gonna trust your own experience because you got a lot of it. And you're gonna trust less the opinions of people who are 25, 30 years younger than you. It's just the way human beings develop. Essentially, we have to have a sense of self that we are comfortable with. And once we get there, you know, it's hard to change that. We don't have time to get into all of the next step, but there's some interesting relationships that we are going to be trying to develop on campus. We're going to take a look at the services that are provide, provided, and then we're going to look into the gaps. And this is where we develop new services. So somewhere between IHR and faculty staff assistance services are discussions like this that help us develop the next set of services. Same here with faculty staff assistance and uh, employee development and learning. The same with IHR and well being, well being and EDL. These are all discussions that will develop in the services if we work together, because the gaps in services are actually in the gaps between the providers. So imagine a team of collaborators, people from different kind of venues who offer service to a group, and not just a group of people to work together, but let's suppose that we form groups based on shared experiences, things that people want to know more about. Well, our services are benefits. So it doesn't have to be that you work together. It could be you and a group of other parents who want to know more about services and maybe you know things that are related to surviving COVID. So imagine then a website on campus that allows you to take a look at needs versus services it makes it very specific to what you're looking for. And you could do this yourself. But we train, we would train supervisors to help you understand how to use this thing. And also, um, faculty staff assistance has a responsibility to keep it current. It means self-empowerment. It means that because we will never have enough providers, what can we do to help ourselves? So this is a, the direction that the culture is kind of leading itself to. And it's something that um, we should be thinking about. 
I know we're supposed to stop at one and I'm looking at 1258. If there's any other questions on here, did I miss any? No, I don't see it. anything else, but uh, we uh, definitely appreciate your time. And yeah, I mean, if anyone has any last thoughts, do you have uh, contact information um, on here for you or for, I know I dropped uh, the, the general uh, faculty, staff and services link earlier. This is how to email me here on campus. And then of course the faculty staff assistance website is also available. Uh, this presentation is also available. Kathy, I can send it or Laura, I can send it to you. Anyone who wants to take a look at it on your own, absolutely welcome to it. The whole idea is to initiate change and whatever we can provide that helps you with the process, just ask. I do appreciate you all giving me an hour of your time. I look forward to getting back in person so I don't have to talk the names and pictures. <laughs> I like engaging with people. Um, and again, thank you for your time. Yes, thank you so much. And we'd love to have you at some point in the future come and meet with uh, the folks here in the research park uh, from all, of course, a wide variety of constituencies, campus units, research park companies, startups, et cetera. So I think this is applicable to any and all. So thank you so much. We appreciate it. And uh, we hope everybody has a great start to the semester and hopefully uh, stays safe and healthy. Thank you so much.